Hi, everybody. My name is Curtis Wagner. I'm a first year here at MIT Sloan, and I am the student lead for Money Mind, Overcoming Cognitive Bias. I am honored and excited to introduce our panelists today. First off, we have Billy Bean with us. He's the executive vice president of baseball operations for the Oakland A's. We have Sam Hinkey, former GM of the 76ers. We have Farhan Zaidi, who is the GM of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And we have, of course, Daryl Morey, our co-chair of the conference of and yeah. GM of the Rockets. Uh, the panel is going to be moderated by Cade Massey. He's a professor at the Wharton School. <laughs> the panel is going to last for 45 minutes, and then we're going to have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. We encourage you to interact with us and ask questions via Twitter using the hashtag MoneyMind. The questions with the most mentions will be asked on stage. And so with that, take it away, guys. Billy's very skeptical. <laughs> Afternoon, guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, Cade Massey, delighted to moderate this panel of illustrious general managers and Sam. Oh. <laughs> wow. What hard. Early. Let him fly early. I like it. <laughs> breaking the ice, man. Breaking the ice. <laughs> so we were backstage talking about why we're here. And, and when Daryl sat down, Daryl had a very clear reason why we're here and a lot of energy behind that reason. So Daryl, why are we here? Uh, we're here because human beings are really, really bad at making decisions. I mean, really bad. You think so? I know so. <laughs> I've seen it. Do you, you seem to have an especial, uh, a special amount of energy around that right now. Uh, well, I had more energy around it last year when we were playing terrible. Um, no, I just, I mean, the more you're in the, our industry and as GMs, our job is really to make decisions, a series of decisions, you know, that hopefully up your odds to win a championship. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's the job. And the more you're in it, the more you realize that people are really bad at, at decision making. I mean, and, and we try to be better than most, that's my job, is to be better than most, along with my team of folks and whatever quantitative methods we have. But the reality is, you realize that you're in the fishbowl not knowing there's water half the time with a lot of your decisions. You don't know if it's, whether it's cognitive bias or anchoring or loss aversion. You, even if you know it's happening, it still affects you in a big way. Mm -hmm. This is worrisome to have you, who most people think of as good at this as anybody in sports, talk about it with this kind of despair. Well, yeah, I, th I just think, you know, there's stuff, well, you know, in your industry, and I think anyone here who's been in the draft or whatever, you make decision after decision and you, and study after study just how, how much, you know, how, you know, evolution has developed our minds to make decisions in certain ways, and they sometimes work really well, but in mi most of the time, I would say, work really manipulate how you make decisions. I mean, just the simple, simple thing of telling doctors, look, uh, there's a, if you tell a patient there's a 10% chance you die, they go like, oh my God, I'm not doing that, but you say like, oh, this one's fine, 90%, you're gonna be fine. They're like, oh, okay, 90%, fine. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, just, you just see how bad people are at making choices. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel more despair now, for sure. <laughs> What's that? I said, I feel more despair now, for sure. <laughs> see, well, this is an interesting question, actually. Daryl's been doing this a little bit longer than you, yes? So, well, do, similar. Do, do, Billy's got the longest tenure. Yeah, so Billy, tell us how He's got a movie, he's got everything. <laughs> That's because I'm better at decision making. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nice. How many titles? And if I wasn't, I wasn't going to tell everybody. That How, many <laughs> How many championships, Billy? Really? Let's go. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 20 years, Daryl. We'll <laughs> yeah, I'm at zero. No, wait, wait, actually, I'm at this, zero. This is actually a good time for this. Did you play? Yeah. What do you know? You didn't play. What do you Neither know? Neither did you. You barely played. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> my, my wife was a Mets fan. She's like, I don't remember him. <laughs> <laughs> OK, with that, sorry. <laughs> good start. <laughs> I'm going to sit over here. Billy. A little further away. Yeah, that's a good idea. Can I come over there yes, with please. you? please. Billy, if you don't have the same level of despair, why do you think that is? How are you navigating things any differently? You know, taken to Daryl's point, I mean, listen, all of us up here 
uh, are sort of rooted in quantitative decision making. But I think you also have to, the one thing over time, every decision is, you have to remind yourself it's an independent decision. And so you sort of have to, in some sense, clear your mind of all those previous biases. Mm -hmm. And we were, as we were saying, we were talking backstage about, and, you, and we all sort of relate a lot of our experiences to decision making with the draft, because we, we all have it, and it's the easiest one to evaluate whether you're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and particularly in baseball, you're wrong a lot because you're drafting 17-year-old kids as opposed to you know, the NBA and the NFL where there's, you're pretty assured that when you draft the first round, you got a pretty good idea how a guy's going to perform. Uh, but the draft room has, and the other thing is we, don't, we see the, uh, players in a, in a different form. Uh, what I mean by that is like uh, if you turn the ACC tournament, you can watch you know, your first round pick over and over and over yeah. again in basketball. In baseball, we, we may be getting video from some uh, you know, we get video now, which we didn't have years ago, but right. we get a video from a, you know, a kid from Iowa, and it was years before we got video. So we have to sort of attach, uh, you know, ways of planting, you know, sort of, you know, it's not necessarily bias, but, you know, a scout, for instance, may say, hey, reminds me of, reminds me of, reminds me of, and it's yes. a way of sort of painting that picture for the, the decision makers. It, it, but in the end, we're all subject to, when we're talking backstage, and in our sport, we may have a, a kid who's a hitter at a certain college, and we may say, well, that college never produces good hitters, yeah. and, uh, or that college uh, does a great job producing pitchers, or doesn't do a great job with the health of their or pitchers. Or UCLA generates great basketball. Yeah, players. so you, you got to stop yourself and remember that this is an independent decision, because there's going to be a Mike Trout out there from Millville, New Jersey, that doesn't fit any of those. And, you know, and, and I remember when me and, Far, me and Farhan went, and, uh, you know, you, the bias years ago, it's not so much now, was, oh, well, you know, East Coast kid, he doesn't play a lot, he's not playing as good competition. Well, as it turned out, the kid from Millville, New Jersey, is arguably one of the greatest players to ever put on a uniform. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, getting to your, your question, you have to stop and at the end say, this is an independent decision. This is a lot of information we have, but this is an independent decision. and. Uh, uh, we have to remember that. When you're in that business, how do you keep yourself from taking a lot of credit when things go well a few years down the road or beating yourself up about it when things go poorly down the road? Uh, well, that's, uh, uh, I, it, I yeah. do a lot of beating yeah, well, myself you got, up. Uh, yeah, well, we, we, the other thing we mentioned backstage is, is that there's sometimes you'll have a decision that turned out wonderfully, beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, and yet you, you have to realize that there was probably a significant amount of luck that went into it. And so, and we, we just did that. We talked about those last uh, few minutes ago. And the other thing is you can have the right process uh, on some other decisions, be completely wrong and sort of question the decision. And what you really got to do is look back to, we really have the process correct. Did we do right. the right things? Right. So uh, listen, every... To some extent, you know, you have to understand that, uh, especially in sports, because there's so many variables. It's not just mm -hmm. the performance of the player. It's also about, I mean, you got health issues, things like that. And uh, there, there's successful sports decisions. Some of it's going to come down to being a little bit lucky, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think part of our responsibility is serving, you know, in our positions of leadership is to almost serve as a corrective force against digging ourselves too much about good moves we made or getting too down about bad moves, because you know, to Billy's point, every decision is independent. And, um, you know, what we've all tried to create uh, is a, a set of, you know, priorities and processes and how we make our decisions. So, um, you know, trying to recreate a good deal or avoid a bad deal are actually greater pitfalls than kind of uh, cleaning the slate and saying, this is our process, this is how we're going to make the, the next decision. And, you know, just adding to that on this idea of every decision being independent. I do think, you know, in this day and age, you know, with a panel with this topic, and it's a big point of conversation, you almost have to worry about overcorrecting. Um, you know, there's so much talk about, you know, the phrase thinking about thinking. Um, and at the end of the day, we have decisions that we have to make. Um, and you want to make sure you're not creating an environment where you might be actually stifling the ultimate decision that you have to make because you're being so conscious of your thought processes and potential biases. So it's a delicate balance. I mean, I echo in a lot of ways Daryl's message of despair that we're all doomed because we're terrible decision makers. I didn't say we're doomed. <laughs> I didn't add doom in there. I, that was just my own info. OK, OK. <laughs> but, um, uh, but you know, the, the flip side, you know, and, and as an example, you know, one thing that 
uh, we do at times uh, in our front offices, if we have a trade that we're talking about, you know, we'll say, well, to avoid groupthink, everybody just grade the scale on a one to 10, you know, scale on an independent ballot, you know, on a secret ballot, um, you know. But, you know, there are a couple of problems with that. One is how independent is it really? Because you have all the same tools yep. and everybody's kind of indoctrinated into the same way of making decisions. So you might actually be creating you know, a false sense of independent data points mm -hmm. by doing that. Um, so, you know, that's just one example where, you know, maybe the best way is to sit around and talk about it because at least there, there's an acknowledgement that there's some group thing going on. Daryl doesn't agree. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talking about it maybe after the secret ballot. Right. Then, then you can really fool yourself here, making a good decision. <laughs> so, so you mentioned process. Right. Or, uh, there you go. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a year. His too, first public too, appearance, too soon. Sam Hinkie. So, how how do you reconcile this the, the models being imperfect and wanting to use them, but at the same time recognizing that they're imperfect? And you guys told a story of when you were working for Billy, you bring in some data, and how did how did that? You're the data guy, and how did that go down? Right. Um, well, yeah, we had a we had a interesting and at times complicated relationship. <laughs> Still uh, do. But yeah, exactly. Uh, but, um, you know, it, uh, you know, what, what we were talking about backstage is this idea is that, that a lot of front offices in different sports are building models now. And there's a question of how far are our models getting us? And is it fair to compare the player models that were being built uh, to stock market models or things like that, because you know a lot of the literature out there about you know stock market models and that type of thing is that when people apply their own expertise beyond the model, they actually wind up doing worse than the model. Right. Uh, the question is in sports, the models that we're building are they <laughs> up to the standard where uh, you're actually making the mo model worse or better by adding some of your own independent information? Right. Right. So Sam, we know you've thought a lot about this. This, this whole notion of like freestyle chess, human machine collaboration. How can you get that? How can you get that right? Because we know the models are helpful, but we also know they're imperfect. I, I would say it's depressing to, <laughs> to hear you talk about it because we often in basketball we would often think of um, of baseball being like so much sort of simpler and better data and more sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction versus like uh, a game where where the players are more independent and so. I think what you're trying to build is something where you're sort of augmented, where you're, you're trying to build something where it's a, um, it's a, it's a, ma a machine that is spitting out you know, what the right decision is, and you're trying to get your hands off the knobs as much as you can. The truth is, your hands are on the knobs all the time, because your data sucks, and you don't have, you don't have nearly enough. Like you might, we, we used to always say like, if you want to have like a kind of a barbershop conversation about like who the best free throw shooter is, like, how boring does it get? Like somebody pull out their phone and just search on something. Mm -hmm. and we'll debate, you know, Ray Allen and Steve Nash and Curry for Mark a Price. Mark yeah, Price. there. <laughs> or we'll get Cleveland bias in. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you get a little something, but like it's just really, it, it's that's really standard and it's really boring. Versus what we deal with is often much more complicated, and so your 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 data is sort of influencing you in real ways, and you're and you're trying to like listen to what signal is in there, but. It, there's, it's not nearly that easy. You have to, there's all these other things that are happening in the world and will happen in this young man's future that, you, that the data knows nothing about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Billy, you're giving credit for birthing this whole world, really, but you're, you're the one who's least quantitative on the panel. How do you think about the use of quant with subjective expertise and traditional scouting? How have you done that? How have you made that work? Well, actually, it's interesting because uh, you know, uh, when we first started out, when it was just me and Paul, when um, Daryl was still in science class in high school. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm older than Paul. Where, he, where he'd be teaching if it wasn't for me and Paul. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you couldn't get in. <laughs> Didn't need to. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> wanna, you want to keep going, D? <laughs> I think you have more. I would like that. <laughs> You've been in more locker rooms than I have, so I think you'll win. So. No, uh, you know, it's funny when when we, when me and Paul first 
started, I say Paul D. Podesta. Uh, when we first started, uh, you know, I, I just got done playing and you know, bring in Paul, and we were really so myopic, and it was all our decisions were just pure quantitative. All the way down, I mean, in some respect, the, the money ball draft, so to speak, uh, was just based purely on objective evidence. You know, we wanted to really go scorched earth mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and see what happened. Uh, I wouldn't recommend learned, that, but, by the way. The, I'm sorry? I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, I was going to say when you said he's the least quantitative, I think he's the most quantitative. Well, yeah, 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 you know, I, which you yeah, might get I, to. I, you know what? Forward would probably as a manager. Point, yeah. As a manager. As a manager, yeah. yeah I think yeah. he, he believed in it more, maybe. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think yeah. Daryl's right. And me and Farah, ironically, and I'll get back to your question, I bring in, you know, Farhan, who sort of comes from a, a quote, quantitative background and academic, and by the end of it, we'd sort of flip relationships mm -hmm. where I had far making emotional decisions on players who quantitatively we should keep uh, to the point where one time I yelled at him that he was becoming the emotional stat guy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and then he proceeded to name his fantasy league football team that year in-house called the emotional stat guy. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, Daryl is, is right, and I think some of it is my own experience. And, 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 trying to stay disciplined too, mm -hmm. you know, as much as anything. But going back, when me and Paul first started, we literally, that's all we looked at. Because we'd seen the other, the extreme the other way. I mean, you know, the entire, my entire career previously was based right. on the subjective. And, the, and, and we made a lot of mistakes and we realized that. And again, looking back, we didn't have as much information as we thought we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting when Farhan came in, uh, it was when we really started to balance it and, and wait, and we realized that the subjective was an important part, that it was a data point that could be built into our decision making. Mm -hmm. and, and Farhan really spearheaded that uh, when he came in, despite his background. And it was ironic that, you know, uh, he balanced us out a little bit. But, but at the beginning, we were, we were just all, I mean, that, this is how we're going to make a decision. We're not going to uh, deviate from it. But we learned from that as well, because we started from a, uh, again, a very disciplined way of doing things and realize at least we can look back and see where we've made mistakes. And we made a ton of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, it was just ironic that a, a guy from MIT would be the guy that balanced this out and realized the value of subjectivity. Yeah, I mean, I think a good metaphor for how our relationship was sometimes is imagining me holding a spreadsheet and handing it to Billy and then us having a fight back and <laughs> yeah. forth yanking it because I was always, because I knew that when Billy got objective information in his hands, he was going to implement it mm -hmm. to a T. Um, and it wasn't necessarily that I didn't believe that was the right thing, but one thing that I think we all have to deal with and encounter is you know, the emotional side of decision making and the fear of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So even if you think it's the right thing, the fact that someone's gonna just take this and run with it, um, you know, can create some hesitation for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've talked about, we talked about that a little bit backstage. You know, we talk about cognitive bias, but there's also kind of an emotional side to decision making that can distort things that you kind of have to manage as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well. I think some of the best analytics folks end up using, weighting it in their decision process lower because they've seen where it can lead you astray. Mm -hmm. And in our sport and his sport where the advantages we're trying to create are smaller and smaller relative to the competition, one of the ways that we hope there will be an edge is that as teams adopt it, they overuse yep. some of the stuff that, that we know to be very hard to use in a, in a, in a very significant way. Mm -hmm. you, you guys have talked about a making objective, very subjective inputs, right? So can, can just to give an example, a concrete example of something that traditional scouts have talked about in the past and you're actually baking them into your models? I would um, say it's, it's as much, a, um, it's as much a, an exercise in intelligence gathering as it is mm -hmm. in anything else. You're, you're trying to predict how, a, how, in our case, a young man will, um, will progress given like wild changes to his lifestyle and wild changes to pressure and everything and changes to his body and uh, coworkers, everything will change. You're trying to project over a, you know, if you're lucky, a 10 year period or so. And so, A, you better have a lot of humility about that uh, and your ability to know that, his own ability to know that himself, much less uh, you better be gathering data in, in a big way. One of the examples I often use is if you describe a set of circumstances that you, that you, you win the lottery and you make a lot of money and a storm hits your house and something else really bad happens in your life and you say, well, how will 
a stranger react to that and you make a prediction versus how will, say, your spouse react to that or how will your parents react to that. Somebody you've known for a long period of time, you can make a much tighter prediction about mm -hmm. how they'll behave in that situation mm -hmm. than you can about somebody that you don't know very well. And so part of the exercise is like really trying to get to know them in a deep way, which is more than just the first storytelling you hear. It's like how do you gather data points by the hundred about a particular player. And we see this in the intelligence business, maybe in our government right now. Like, we don't have, there's not, there's not a phone call or two that, that people look at for, the, for some intel. They have tens of thousands of pages of documents over decades about how a particular person will react mm -hmm. in, in a certain situation given a set of mm -hmm. inputs. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to make predictions on how that person will react over time. So this has consequences for how you run your organization and what you reward and what you want your people to do, right? So Billy, you were talking about how you think about scouts or how you evaluate scouts. It, you, you, you said it's not even, you don't even expect them to be right. Is that right? No, well, no, I don't expect, I, I don't, you know, one of the things in foreign can, knows this is true because he sat with us for 10 years right next to each other is that I think the idea that, you know, you can, anyone for an hour can go look at somebody play at 17 years old and be able to predict what's going to happen in 10 years. It's just, I haven't, I think it, it's asking too much. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, but, you know, for us, again, going to some of Sam's point is, you know, one of the things that changed, uh, you know, for us, we realized, listen, at the end of the day, this is all about gathering as much information as you possibly can to mm -hmm. hopefully put yourself in the best position to make a decision. And there's some things that we couldn't get in Oakland in terms of, you know, uh, we could get all the quantitative evidence we wanted. Uh, but we realized what we were missing was, to use the term that uh, Sam, sort of that ground intelligence, there's things mm -hmm. that a, a, a scout or living in Oklahoma can tell you that you have no chance of getting unless you've got somebody there. And it can be really important in the decision-making process, you know, what type of kid he is, you know, you know, obviously you can get what type of student he is, but there's just so many small things that really we started baking into our decision making and, mm -hmm. uh, and realized it was important uh, because, I mean, it's funny, I don't know how you guys are, but in baseball we'll draft like, you know, 50 guys now. We're jealous of you. Yeah, yeah well. Yeah. Uh, we but, just get like two babies, you, know, yeah. you get like 50. <laughs> So. Well, the thing, the thing for us is what's interesting is you can go through a draft, we draft 50 guys, and you know really quickly when you made, you know, a lot of times oh, you, yeah. made your, you know right away. After, really? Sam taught me that, actually. Yeah, he called it the inflection yeah, point. Yeah, yeah and, and it, you know, maybe when you get to instruction league or a month into the season, you know, it's when all of your staff has had a chance to interact and, you know, You'll get to the point where maybe three weeks after these guys have been playing, your fourth rounder is better than your first rounder, and everybody knows it. Wow. It, it, and you've got to be okay play? with that. A lot yeah. of places are trying to force, at least in our sport, yeah. they're trying to force their higher pick to be better than their worst. Like we picked Chandler Parsons. I think while Sam was there, when our third pick at 38, and he was by far the best player we drafted that year. Clear after the first practice, after the lockout. After the first you practice. You practice one time, and you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. He's better than the other two. And the owner actually, very, our owner, uh, very smart, was like, hey, you made a huge mistake there. Normally you'd think, oh, add a boy, <laughs> second rounder, doing good. He's like, you made a huge mistake. And I'm like, damn it, you're smart, we did. Like, we should have picked him earlier. And, I, and then I was like, would you believe I knew he'd last to 38? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, no. I was like, well, you shouldn't believe that either. <laughs> so um, to answer one of your things, though, like, think, Kahneman and probably a paper you've done has proven that subjective ordinal ranking of ordinal ranking of subjective concepts can help your decision making, right. um, even if there's no quantitative basis right. to it initially. So, uh, yeah. So we have scouts. I'm sure you do too. Like rank, you know, things like um, habits to improve and mm -hmm. things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a great passage in the uh, Daniel Kahneman book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he talks about firemen and how good they are at knowing exactly when a building is about to collapse. They know exactly when to get out of the building. Um, and they get asked about it, how do you know? And they just say, it was my gut. It was just, you know, instinct. Um, the reality the ones, is- The ones that get out. The ones that get out. Are, are get out. <laughs> exactly, there's a yeah. little bit of a sampling issue. Okay. The other ones struggle. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> selection bias, for sure. <laughs> or Darwinism, something like that. Uh, uh, but to me, that's actually, you know, I, I mean, and when you really start probing, you find that it's, it's not just gut or instinct, it's, you know, a combination of their experience and 
you know, the temperature, the smell, like the intensity of the, of the light, like they right. are right. taking in a ton of information and data and making a decision um, and they view it as just instinct or gut, but it's not. And to me, as I read that book, that was the best analogy to scouting that, yeah, you know, great. I could, uh, that, that I could find, which is a lot of times your scouts will tell you, ah, it's just, this is my gut feel guy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's a ton of information and value in that for us to say, ah, it's just subjective or it doesn't matter. Um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right to ask the question, the challenge of sort of peeling back the layers and figuring out a way to formalize that information mm -hmm. so you can use it more systematically, that's a big challenge for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys are in the unique position of having worked for these two. So they're sitting here, the wise, experienced ones. So we can call it horseshit when they say it. It's <laughs> the biggest difference. They, they, yeah, they actually know I'm it's waiting. not true. I'm waiting. I haven't found any yet. I'm looking. Yeah. So w what have you learned, either positively or negatively, about managing cognitive biases from these two guys? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say a lot of what, um, what I learned sort of watching Daryl is, is how you would try to strip things down and, and isolate things as much as you could. Uh, the truth is you get some sort of bleed over, but we would, we would talk in a really deep way about a player's skills. Uh, the truth is like, there's a player I like him, I like him a lot, he's you know, second or third pick, you know, he's really good. Okay, why? Let's get in a really deep way and see how you're weighting things because to Billy's point about sort of say a scout is, you know, we used to say like the job is not to be the mini GM. Right? The job is to like, bring all the evidence you can and help us find more evidence and help us and help poke holes in all the arguments we're making, particularly me, if I'm making arguments, we, you should poke holes in, in those. But, but what we really need to know is like, how you're weighting things. Because if what you find is like, you, you really like this player and you think he's the number one pick in the draft and you don't think you shoot that well, you don't think you do this that well or, or rebound that well, he's not that athletic, whatever, but, like, but your guy told him he's awesome. Right, and that he brings it, and he's super competitive. Well, great, okay, fine, but now we learned that almost 80% of your evaluation is your data point or two, which sometimes has signal in it. Sometimes <laughs> it's actually a guy. One of the things I would often do is read the body language of the people who are angry as we'd rank. Mm. And then ask and probe and probe, like what's going, because they're, they're mad, they're mad because they're trying to advocate on behalf of the organization, like, no, no, we should pick this guy. Mm -hmm. And so I'm asking a hundred times, like why? Like why, explain to me why? And sometimes you'd get a, an answer that's a story that I'm, I'm quick to discount, but you'd sometimes wait it, which is like, I swear to God, this coach that coaches there was my college roommate. And we've talked about 500 players over the years. He's my number one source in the league. I've heard him talk about all these other players that he's coached. It's not that I think he's wrong. I've never heard him talk about someone like that, mm -hmm. right? Okay, oh, fan out. Okay, we're calling 20 people at high school, you know, next week. We're, right. we're, we're going to go search that. That's a hypothesis to be tested. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. That, that might be something. We had a coach one time that came back and watched a player, and he said, I think he's got the best handle I've ever seen. And I'm like, oh. What? And he's like, the best handle I've ever seen. And I think if he comes to the NBA, he might have the best handle in the NBA. And I'm like, all right, that 10 of us, everybody's watching an hour video, just do tomorrow. You're getting random samples of video. I want you to rate his ball handling and write 500 words on his ball handling. And everyone goes and does it, right? And we come back and you're like, there was something there, right? But that's a latent skill that maybe we wouldn't have had otherwise. You're not gonna just ingest it, but you, you, you better be ready to test it. Mm -hmm. but, but you're trying to like separate those things apart. I think that was something common that, that, um, that a lot of people do. That's why in hiring, it's important to have very passionate well-informed, well-prepared people because they will advocate and you only learn in the strong advocation of someone because you see that they're like, it's so wrong that this guy's ahead of that guy. And then you can learn why. And until that moment, everyone's just sort of like, yeah, he's higher, lower, whatever. You know, like, I, I, we don't learn anything from that. Now, Farhan, they made entire movies about how Billy handled that kind of scene. Right. What, what, what did you learn from how Billy handles that kind of scene? Um, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I have to say, uh, I, I, I was kind of sort of thinking about your original question and kind of what I learned about Billy, and I, I had to figure out a way to work this in. So I would say the first thing I learned was um, how to be smart with money. Be careful with money, which is why when I saw Billy, the first thing I told him was, hey, this sport coat's from Target. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there's no pocket. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, but, uh, 
you know, I would get back to what he was saying earlier about, um, you know, uh, sort of wiping the slate clean with every decision, mm. you know? And, uh, you know, sometimes it wasn't just wiping the slate clean with every decision, but sort of wiping the slate clean with an entirely new strategy. You know, I think back to, you know, uh, in 2011 when we traded three of our best players, An Andrew Bailey, uh, Gio Gonzalez, and Trevor Cahill, and it was kind of, we'd been building, building, and Billy was like, let's just, uh, you know, scrap it, start again, get some young talent, and go from there. And I was like, well, these guys are good. What are we going to do? And he was like, this is, you know, this is, this is the right strategy from this point forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I still think, for me, that's something that's a continued work in progress. But I think that comes from experience and, and kind of, once you've done the job for long enough, I feel like you've made every kind of mistake mm -hmm. and every kind of miscalculation. And so you're not really trying to avoid anything mm -hmm. at that point. Okay. I will say there's a bunch of tricks that can help. I think you're still... You're still often blind. You're blind way more than you want to be. But um, we're all so good at being critical of someone else's arguments. Like, write down your argument and read it back to yourself out loud. Yeah. Because, like, if, you, if you're, re you're so critical to read a paragraph and mm -hmm. say, like, ah, oh, that's not, and you poke a hole in it, right? Or, mm -hmm. or have somebody else do it. And those sort of things often help. Or we would, we would like, write, we'd sort of call it sometimes the investment thesis, like, we want to pick this player, we want to pick him here, and here are all the factors why, and here's like the, the high level points of evidence we have for those, and sort of our confidence interval about those. And you like write it and set it aside and come back like two weeks later and you're like, who wrote that? <laughs> like who, who wrote bullet point number three? Like that, that can't be true. Like whatever I saw that made me say that or whatever they, we, we just, that's, our evidence is super thin there. So if, so if we're betting that that, that that's a big part of the thesis, we're in, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. well, I think with each of the cognitive biases, you can, you can try and create these tricks. So endowment effect, I call it the Monty McNair rule. He's one of our great staff members. Reverse every trade. Every trade mm -hmm. you're talking about, if you held the other side, would you actually do it? It's shocking how often you go like, we wouldn't even like think about doing another. And then uh, cognitive bias, like try and not, not decide what you think as long as possible, mm -hmm. right? Um, just too off the top of my head. So, mm -hmm. so you, you guys talked also a little bit about regret and how regret can get in the way of making, making trades sometimes. And what was the solution you proposed for that? Yeah, no, I, yeah, it was uh, backstage. This is going to really reflect bad on my humanity, but I'll tell the story <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, we were sitting around once talking about a trade where we were going to trade a young player for somebody that was you know, really gonna help our, our playoff push. And there was a lot of kind of consternation about, about giving up this player. And, you know, I was concerned that a lot of that was just sort of, you know, uh, avoidance of regret rather than like, what's really the right, right move? Awesome. Like, which player would we rather have from yeah. this point forward? So I said, all right, well, what if we make this trade, but instead of having to send this guy to the other team, we just get to take him out back and shoot him? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and everybody said, well, you're a morbid human being, first of all. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when you couch but, it. But they also said, right, well, yeah, we'd make we, the trade then. We, we do it, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think a lot. Winning of, argument. Huh? A winning argument. I guess. And um, yeah, uh, people were much more careful around me after that point. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's sort of an example where you kind of couch a decision in a different way and you kind of come up with a different mm -hmm. Sort of, uh, you know, different conclusion. We've been talking about general managers and their biases, but you guys live kind of in the middle of an organization. You've got to navigate your owners' biases. You've got to navigate your coaches' and players' biases. It, do you find it easier to, to to handle the upstream stuff or the downstream stuff? What's it like to have to manage your owners' biases? I'm, with, I'm for no chicken. <laughs> Not chicken. No, I mean, I've had the benefit of our owner. I, I, you know, I got him later. I think it's very hard to be an owner. Uh, you get, you're generally very successful in everything else before with much better odds. Like, you get into our industry, it's one out of 30, one out of 32, horrible odds. None of these people who buy teams are used to losing at the level they almost all experience at some point. I think it's very hard and the press comes at you. It's a very public job. So I think all, almost all owners early make many, many, many mistakes as much as GMs do early. Uh, I, got, I got the benefit of, you know, coming to the Rockets when 
our owner had owned the team 13 years, and I think he, one thing he was very smart about is he actually holds his cards close, generally, uh, and then only, very Ben Franklin-like, he only inserts at the right point because he wants, he actually truly wants our independent mm -hmm. opinion. But it's not always perfect, and there have been times, you know, when, when we've had to, you know, say, hey, you know, when you even hint at leaning a certain way, it's almost impossible for us not to immediately shift our odds of doing something like in seconds from hearing even his body language of how, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, because it's, it's his team and we're all here to steward his team, uh, you know, it's, it's natural, right? I mean, it, I think there's got to be, multi, I mean, you're the academic, there's got to be multiple studies that when the, the leader uh, of an organization takes a certain tack, everyone sort of tacks behind almost immediately. It's, and I think it's worse in sports than it is in, uh, in other industries must be similar, but, but I don't think universally, maybe, maybe sort of high stakes politics or something is, is similar to that. But because the jobs are so hard to get and people, if they're, if they're smart, like recognize what long odds they got to get there, that it leads to this sort of hunkering down way too often. And so you find a lot of organizations have lots of survivors that have made it through dozens of regime changes one way or another. One of the ways they did that is like, don't stick your neck out. Mm -hmm. And it, particularly if, if the owner uh, is leaning a certain way, or you've heard rumors that the owner doesn't like this player, doesn't like this sort of coach. That, don't I stick think your it, neck out and play the blame game. That's a great way to survive generally. Mm -hmm. I, it reminds me when, um, when, when Obama came into office, I mean, he was sort of the first maybe Blackberry addict that had been president. And so he was like fighting to like keep his BlackBerry and the and Secret Service didn't like it and everything. And so they were trying to figure that out. And he, I think he ended up keeping it. But, but one of the things he said was like, it's not the keyboard. Like, he's like, these are the people that tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, these are the people in my life that like, like, dude, what are you doing? Like, what did you just say yesterday? That's not, that wasn't part of the plan. We've known you for decades, yet something about you getting into Washington and getting in this environment does it where, versus being in the White House, where like all the information is filtered up to you and everyone's got an agenda and everyone's got sort of their own career agendas as well. And they just leave you with, you know, the hardest of hard decisions and only, and package it and frame it in just a certain way. 10% chance you're gonna, you know, everybody's gonna die or 90% chance this will be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, Billy. Oh, no, so it's just, yeah, I've actually had four managing partners since I've been there in Oakland. And a survivor. I'll, yeah, well, I guess I keep my neck down, I uh, <laughs> yeah. not to be noticed. Uh, that's me. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, we had the Haas family, and then Steve and Schott and Ken Hoffman and uh, Lou Wolf, and then uh, most recently John Fisher. Uh, and one of my favorite, and, and, and again, and all, I um, was lucky to work for all of them. I mean, they all had their, uh, you know, great things about them. But the one thing I always appreciated, that there was a reason they owned a baseball team. You know, they did, just did, <laughs> someone just didn't give them a baseball team. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my, and, and all of them were different personalities. And I remember my first year as the GM, um, we had the second pick in the draft because Alderson was the GM before and we were terrible. So my first year, <laughs> uh, so we got the second pick in the draft, and it was my first draft. And this was a time when we didn't have um, a cap on bonuses. And so we had budgeted, I think, like $2.5 million for Mark Mulder. And uh, it was pretty obvious that the, the cost of signing him was going to go up by about $500,000. And uh, that was a lot of money to us then. That's way over budget for us in Oakland at that mm -hmm. time. And what my owner was Ken Hoffman, who was a, a guy who, who was a, just a really a tough, tough guy. He'd made his, you know, he started as a bricklayer and went on to become a developer. So he's sort of a made man. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember sitting in my, one of my first ownership meetings and I needed to ask Ken for $500,000 more <laughs> to sign Mark Mulder in and, and my first year. And Ken looks at me and he's a big gruff man and he goes, can you guarantee me he's going to be in the big leagues? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, there's no way I can guarantee that, Ken. Right? I literally just told him the truth. Because yeah, right. uh, in this business, you can't guarantee anything. And, and he literally just said, good, you have the money. Oh. And, and, wow. and what I realized, and this was sort of Ken's style, it, it was that, listen, he just didn't want you. He, he was a smart guy. And you weren't going to pull one over on him. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was sort of a good lesson your first, my first year as a GM. I mean, mm -hmm. there was this. Uh, you know, you, you know, you mentioned uh, Sam, and we all are aware of you know sort of the survivors. You know, but uh, at the end of the day, I mean, listen, these guys again—they're smart guys. And and what I realized is that you know, 
really being as transparent myself as an executive was probably going to be the best approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's times, and Farhan's been with me, where, listen, as a GM, we all kind of know when our team's good, and you know, even going into the season, assuming mm -hmm. health. And, uh, and, and one thing we certainly internally we never tried to do was try and spend things and, you know, sort of knowing that we're going to play a season in three months and tell our owner, we, we've got the best team since the 98 Yankees. You just wait and see, knowing that it wasn't true. So, mm -hmm. and the lesson that first year was that there was definitely uh, transparency from my own end was, mm -hmm. was the right way to go. And, 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 and quite frankly, that's how you dealt with Ken. And other guys are different, but Ken, like you said, he was a tough guy. He didn't, he was going to smell it out if you were going to... Mm -hmm. Because, again, I couldn't guarantee anything. And then to this day, uh, sometimes it's more comfortable to guarantee your own or something, even though you can't do it. But in the end, it's, it's I, th I think, worked well for myself, and mm -hmm. I learned that lesson my first year. What role does, you guys are, are at least historically been trying to do something different than other general managers. So baseball's maybe catching up some, basketball's catching up some. But in general, you've been trying to do something different or do more of it than other people are. What role does job security have when you're trying to do something that different? I would just say, just to clarify your question, like I think one thing I think all of us have done is more take the lessons that are sort of obvious that everyone's agreed to and taking them to the logical conclusion. Taking them further. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, for example, us, you know, it's better to make three than two on a shot, you know. Genius, right? But <laughs> You know, but taking it to its logical conclusion, which is shoot 50 of them a night, is something people hadn't done. Or, right. obviously, I'll speak in our, and I think, but these, Sam, in, in his job, you know, you need stars to win. I can speak for him. And I can tell you that the best way to reliably get the top franchise star you need to win a title is through the draft. Mm -hmm. And he took it to its logical conclusion, I think, eventually with a lot of success for that franchise. Uh, so I, I would say that's more what we've done than, you know, necessarily, well, I don't know, you can speak for yourself, but like not necessarily than being like these innovators that came up with stuff no one else did. We just said, well, why is any, like if that's the right answer, why don't we just do it? <laughs> like, if like, 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 little... like football, why are we still punting? It still drives me crazy. Like mm -hmm. that's your, you know, you, Romer, Romer had the paper, yeah. paper, but like it makes no sense. It's really upsetting. That's why we have the title of the panel this year, that we, we're still not going on fourth down, like yeah. when it's overwhelming. But anyway, sorry. Rant off. Sorry. I think I killed your question. <laughs> sorry. But, you, but no, you, you did clarify it, but it still, ra it still raises the issue. Mostly, there's just less, there's not much latitude for people to take things to extreme. Right. And so or, right. so the, the consequence is you have these GMs who are themselves playing it safe. And they may, not be, they may not be biases as much as pursuing the incentives they have. I'm going to trade up because I need a player to win right now. So it may not even be a bias. It's just the structure that the owners, that the owners built. I just think you just have to be super clear about where your edge is or where you're trying to get it. You might, you, you might not get it, like depending on your particular strategy. But if you're, not, if you're not singularly focused on an edge and then willing to resource behind it, then what are you doing? What are you doing? You're trying to be 1% better at everybody else at everything? Like, the, these leagues are good. They, they, they run pretty, pretty solid tournaments to get people leading them in charge. You end up with, a, much, like, much like ownership, you end up with like a pretty darn talented set of people mm -hmm. uh, with a set of rules that equalize everything, generally, um, all trying for exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Pretty close. And so if you actually want to be different, you're going to have to have some edge in what it is. And some teams, um, the edge might be in a particular place, in scouting here, or in, or in trades this way, or in uh, recruiting players in a certain way, or the particular gravitas they might bring to a free agent meeting. Like, mm -hmm. you, I think all of those are reasonable, um, but you better, you better have one. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to the extent that we've implemented differentiated strategies, it hasn't been because they were different, it's bec been because we thought they were right, mm -hmm. you know? And that, you know, Ultimately, your answerability to ownership, and these guys have alluded to it uh, a little bit, there's you know, different levels of involvement from different owners. Some are very involved, some are not as involved, and frankly, you know, some, some owners may hear more about how the team is doing or whether it's been successful or not from their grandkids than they hear from you, I mean, depending on their proximity and how much uh, uh, interaction you have with them. So, you know, I, I think 
you implement a strategy that you believe in, and if it's differentiated, it's differentiated, uh, and you know you play it out, and uh, you know sometimes it, it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. But I think what's behind it is a degree of conviction about it, and not necessarily, hey, let's do something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Billy, how's it been for you over time? I, I was at a small conference where you came by and spoke a little bit in the early 2000s. And we talked about the idea that, you might have said this, you said, you know, it's like walking down the street and people just have dollar bills laying around and we're just picking up dollar bills. And we asked, well, what happens when people start adjusting to that? And you said, well, then there'll be 50 cents and then there'll be a quarter. So how has it been for you and how do you think about it right now? Well, I mean, you, you, first of all, you look at this conference. I, this is the first year I've been to this, and uh, I was amazed at the attendance. And if you sort of think, mm -hmm. think of why it was started, mm -hmm. you know, going back to 2003 when Michael released the book, and even before that, uh, I, I think we always knew in Oakland at some, first of all, it, it, the game, my game, my business, and, I'm, and I know with Daryl and Sam, two guys I know I mean, uh, for a long time, known Sam actually before I think Daryl, because he was in grad school at Stanford mm -hmm. when we first met. And uh, uh, so he, I saw, you know, when Paul came into the game, you know, and then, you know, you have Theo and, you know, the guys like Farhan came into the game, the game has become so intelligent. And, you know, trying to find that edge. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you don't even know, the thing is, you're not really privy now, nowadays to what other teams are doing. Everything's proprietary. I mean, even people are hiring staffs, and so you may think you're doing something different, and you're not. I mean, mm -hmm. and for me, I've only been in Oakland, so I have no idea how other teams are, are doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you assume, again, that you're, you're cutting edge, and you may find out, and you know, Farhan's had the experience of going to our, you know, Oakland and, and now working with Andrew in Los Angeles. So he does, he's able to see the difference firsthand, but we don't really know. I mean, I have no idea if we're Fred Flintstone or if we're cutting edge, because again, people, you know, now just like any of this is big business, and when people are creating things, they're keeping right. it to themselves. So, right. uh, uh, but the game is so much smarter now. I mean, the, the, the group of people that are running baseball teams now, I mean, every, I mean they're, they're, there's no low hanging fruit at the executive level in baseball. These mm -hmm. guys are all really, really mm -hmm. bright. They've got amazing staffs. It's, uh, it's all gone? Zero out of 30? Well, no, I mean, just it's becoming more efficient. You're, in, in my opinion, you're getting more of an efficient market, uh, and we're ultimately probably more so than people think when you... Well, you know, I'll tell you a market that's not efficient is football. So there's a question here from, from, from someone who's, who's tweeted, do you think you could switch sports and be an effective GM? It's a question for all of you guys. Do you think you could switch sports and be an effective GM? I, yeah, I, I, well, yeah, I mean, my simple question would be yes. I mean, um, I think that, uh, listen, there's, a, there's certainly nuances. There's things that, you know, Daryl does and his, or and Sam does and me and Farhan do that are different. But I think ultimately, listen, at the end of the day, you got all the information you want. Execution's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I mean, crossing the Rubicon is executing. Otherwise, this stuff would have been going on 30 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it can sit in the basement. Nobody, if nobody's going to do it, and understand doing it in sports is doing it in front of a crowd every single day that has an opinion immediately on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, leadership is, is uh, ubiquitous to, uh, I think, any business, particularly any mm -hmm. sport, in my opinion. Uh, you know, listen, you can hire guys in any sport to fill in the gaps that you don't have. The one thing that's important in our job, and you know, we touched on it, you're talking about you know, you know working with your owners, working with people below yourself, making decisions at, at a public level, those are leadership qualities. So mm -hmm. my, my answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to that, it's, it's um, I think it really depends, like how you hear that answer really depends on how you see the job. And if you see the job as, um, as making consistent decisions and trying to build an organization that makes rational decisions over the long term, and builds all the infrastructure that can make that happen and builds a culture that makes that possible to win, given a set of rules, um, then, I, then I think the answer is yes. If you, if you see the job differently, I think the answer to those folks who are plenty reasonable is obviously no. Obviously, that would never, that would never work. You, you know, if, if I was starting a tech company, one of the first guys I'd hire would be this guy right here. And, and one of the other guys I'd hire is Paul Sam Ebers. or Farhan? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, both of them, actually. <laughs> Either. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, Good choices. And, and, and I've always said that even, you know, Paul's not here, too. And, and uh, I mean, when I hired Paul, you know, he was a Harvard econ major. These, yeah. these guys weren't in my sport at the time. So I remember getting fan letters like, what are you doing hiring this Harvard econ major to help you evaluate talent? 
Right. And that was the reaction. And the fact of the matter is, is you know, being smart works in everything you do. And as far as being a general manager, again, I think that's a leadership position. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Jack Welch would have been a pretty good general manager, mm -hmm. and he probably would have surrounded himself with really smart guys and mm -hmm. made really good mm -hmm. decisions. Yeah, All right, he kind of stole my answer. I was going to say, I think I would be a good NBA GM because I just hire Sam and go on extended vacations. <laughs> 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 nice. So another question from our audience. Uh, this is kind of a perennial question. You guys would be interesting to hear from on this. How does team chemistry contribute to winning and vice versa? This is Billy's favorite question. Yeah, yeah. Billy. <laughs> team <bad>. Softball. <laughs> He's got to Knock skill it out. himself. Knock it out. Uh, well, listen, I, I'll just speak my own experience because at some point somebody's going to be able to quantify it. And uh, my experience with my team has been my, my good teams have always had great chemistry and my poor teams have had poor, bad chemistry. I, I, I've always, I've only been able to make decisions based on evidence and the evidence that we've always had in Oakland is that we've had great clubhouses and we've been known for our clubhouses in Oakland, and they've always been synonymous with winning baseball games. And uh, uh, so it, it, I mean, you could go on and on about this forever, but I've never really seen a team that's won that didn't have great chemistry, and I've always assumed it was because of the what, win. What's causal, though? Which direction? <laughs> the arrow. I'm sorry, say again? What, which direction is the arrow? What, what, you, okay. you mean, does chemistry cause winning? Yeah, or the other. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Uh, well, if you're asking my opinion, I, okay, Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to learn from you. Well, I think here, here's what I know. Here's what I know. We, if you consider having some control as a GM, is the players you pick, and if you pick players that win, I, I'm going to bet the ranch you're going to have pretty good chemistry. Uh, again, I've never been able to select a, a player based solely on, say, the perception of his personality or how he fit into a clubhouse, mm -hmm. and had that work out and successfully create a winning team. We hear about it, we hear about it, you know, in the news recently in the NBA. I mean, teams move players partially for that reason. Teams, fans question whether teams should acquire players that have that baggage. What do you think about it on the NBA side? Is it the same answer or is it different? Well, a good team will absorb that. You know, we, we've had, you know, I, I, we've had some great, great uh, clubhouses when I, you know, going back to the Hudson Mulder Zito days from Giambi to Hada, those, those were not only great players, but they were great guys. And when you have that type of guy, I, uh, you know, or say that has a re reputation when he's absorbent to a winning environment, it, it, again, it, you know, it, it, it seems to work. If it's in an environment that's not uh, as successful, then it, it seems to create a, create a problem. I will say this, I have had a few players. I mean, the one player that I acquired specifically for that reason, was we, we had Ronnie Gant in Oakland, and, and we had a really good team, and, and, and Ronnie had played on winning teams when he was younger, and, uh, and we had him two different times. And, and Ronnie was one guy I remember, and David Justice was another one where you brought him in, and they, in, they really enhanced the environment. But the environment was already good, and mm -hmm. they just sort of took it to another level. Mm -hmm. uh, but the acquisitions were based on the fact that we already had a good team. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't the reverse, where we're just going to get these guys, and we're not very good, and we think these, these guys are, are going to make us good just by mm -hmm. virtue of their force of their personality. Okay. I agree with Billy that a good strong locker room creates option value for certain guys you can add mm -hmm. um so that that's a big one in terms of like the call i you know for me it's all about franchise phase so when when yao ming and tracy mcgrady were both uh gone you know their careers were over because of injury um you know we didn't focus on we we just desperately needed high-end talent and often those will not come in perfect packages because if they did, they would just stay on the teams they're on. So we pursued them. And now, now that we're in a much better winning situation with a pretty high probability to win the title, not as high as we want, uh, you know, the amount we spend on making sure all our role players mm -hmm. um, will be high quality habits, high quality people to be around is, is much higher. Can we in that, to Daryl's particular point, um, in that team, Yao and McGrady were young and, and were playing well, and B Battier was there. We had, a, we had a pretty good team, and we traded a first round pick for Ron Artest. Right. It was on a one year deal, and, and Ron came and helped us in a big way, and, and Yao and Mac both were pretty injured that year, but helped us in a big way, and it wasn't without 
issue. It had plenty of challenges, but like there was very little Ron could do in his personal life or in the locker room or in the team that would like affect Shane Battier or Luis Scola or those guys like Chuck, they, Hayes. They, Chuck Hayes. They knew exactly who they were and they were comfortable with that and, and it was hard for them to sort of be thrown off that by any particular blip. And we had some blips, but at, this, but at the same time, I think it was worth it. Now, when it came time to re-sign him to a five-year deal, we didn't, right? And he went somewhere else and in that place ended up winning a title that very first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, you hear the question asked a lot about causality with chemistry. I'm not sure that's the right question. I've always kind of viewed it as you can get caught in a vicious cycle or you can wind up in a virtuous cycle depending on, you know, the type of character that you have on your team when you start winning, uh, and you have good guys, they sacrifice for the good of the team. And, and, you know, in baseball, there are material things that players can do that are unselfish that help you win. Uh, and when you have the right environment, they're more likely to do those things. So it does manifest itself on the field. Your relief pitchers are more likely to pitch on days when they're not feeling well, as opposed to saying, I'm just not going to pitch today, I'm not up to it. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, you start losing and everyone says, we're losing because I'm not playing enough. Um, or, you know, the manager's not doing this or that and it can kind of spiral the other way. So. I think this is back to the start. We used to always say, back to sort of making poor decisions or like humility in this, is like rank order all the best chemistry guys in the league this coming year. Right. So you ought to have pretty low confidence in your ability to predict who's gonna have the biggest positive impact on chemistry. And the truth is what we all do is answer a different question, which is like, hey, this guy was really awesome for us three years back in a different situation. Right. It's like, yeah, that was really great. But like this context is wildly different, right? right? And so we, we should have generally lower confidence. So we're down to just about five minutes. Um, Billy, this is your first time at the conference. Uh, if, if, what do you think is the most important thing for us to be thinking about as a community? Or what do you think is the most important issue in baseball and sports going forward from your perspective? Oh, God, that's a tough that's question. That's a big case. question. <laughs> yeah. a lot of responsibility. I'm ready. Uh, well, let me be not the, but what is yeah. a, what is a important issue that you're concerned about, you think is coming up, you think about? we should pay more attention to? Gosh, I don't want to disappoint you, but I've, I actually, I love where sports has gone. I love the fact that this conference is here, that it's become a meritocracy, that it's the best and the brightest are now working in this game. That, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I love where sports is going, so I, I wouldn't say concern. Uh, I, I love the fact that sports have become global in terms of our interest in them, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I love the fact that the NFL plays in London. I love that I'm now a consumer of the English Premier League, despite the fact that I've never played one minute of soccer in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's an amazing opportunity for all sports. Uh, and, and again, the fact that, you know, our business was very, you know, baseball, we hired, you know, we hired guys like me, ex-players and things like that, and the fact mm -hmm. that the front offices are, you know, flooded with really, really bright people that uh, are having an amazing impact on the business. And, and we are, and I, that's what I like, want baseball to do, just like other sports, is to reach beyond our borders, you know, and, and understand that participation doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, that you have to participate to, to have interest in something. As I said, I don't, I've never played any soccer in my life, and mm -hmm. yet I watch as much you know, European and EPL as, as, as anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, with baseball, I'd love, I would love for us to see us playing games in Europe. And, and I love, we always volunteer to go internationally in Oakland. So, so I don't have concerns. I'm actually excited. And mm -hmm. again, because people who now work in this industry, and, and Farhan's a great example. I mean, his mom was so crushed when I hired him, right? <laughs> uh, because he was in the process of finishing his PhD. And then he comes and we would we pay you about 30 grand to come work for us, right? The fact that I can, that I have access mm -hmm. to that kind of, you know, this type of, you know, person who wants to come work in my industry, I mean, I'm competing against, you know, I live in, I'm in the Silicon Valley, heart of Silicon Valley, so I'm looking for the same type of employees that the biggest companies in the world mm -hmm. are. The advantage we have in our business, and all of us have, is that a, a Sam will get out of Stanford Business School and come work for me for 20 cents on the dollar because he has a passion for this business and the sport. So, so I didn't mean to Easy not now. address your concerns. <laughs> <laughs> well, not anymore, but okay. so. By the way, I'm not sure anchoring. I told my mom that an he an $3,000. Yeah, yeah. Now she yeah he, his mom was upset that, I mean, he was getting close. He promised his mother he'd, fin he'd complete his PhD, which he did oh. while he was in Oakland. And, uh, uh, but I mean, the fact, again, that I can bring in a guy like this into the sport. So I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm actually very hopeful. And I, 
I love, again, the fact that sports are now global, that the world is so small. And, and we, we used to joke we hired, I'm not going to say who, we hired someone. We always teased him. We were like, oh, your parents are disappointed. You're not a doctor or a, <laughs> or a lawyer. And like one day he's like, you know, Daryl, that joke's not that funny. Because <laughs> they really are disappointed. I'm not a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> so I was like, OK, I'll stop. Daryl, you started this out with a little bit of despair. How do you feel now? Do you feel better? Was this therapy or no? no it's just one hour. It doesn't change anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think I'm hoping for folks like yourself who do research on this to keep giving us the tools to overcome a lot of these, you know, things that evolution have messed up our heads to, you know, while we're making decisions. Um, you know, a, a big one that's I, I realized only recently came out is this loss, loss aversion, just a big one. Like I, I found out from, you know, the people I work with, like we, we end up making, we made a lot of transactions in the period between James Harden, Tracy, Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming and James Harden. And, you know, so a lot of our players around the league playing well and just the amount that that created uh, issues for a lot of the people that I need to care about, fans, owners, everything, uh, shocked me. Like for me, you know, we're just trying to build a team to win. So if they're all playing, that means we've made good decisions before. I see yeah. it as a positive, but I've, you know, shockingly, um, folks saw it as a negative. Yeah. So. So they want you to only acquire players that other teams don't want. Is that the safest? Yeah, that seems easy. Like that's, <laughs> that seems. Like, yeah, I I did say we could solve the issue by mm -hmm. never getting a good player. Then, mm -hmm. then we'd never have a player on another team to worry about. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, guys, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave.